We all dream to succeed. Whether we want a successful career or a big family or perhaps ideally something in between, we all aim at something. Some people aim higher though. They want to invent, to explore, to make a name for themselves. In the 1400s, it wasn't just a person that acted this way, it was a whole country. That country was China and it was an immense success. But then, ironically, they became afraid of their own success and withdrew into themselves. And that mistake radically changed history. Hi, my name is Sebastian and you're watching Mistakes That Changed The World. So China is indeed the origin of many great inventions and achievements. Things like the Great Wall, the printing press or gunpowder, to name just a few. And although the whole world has heard of these, or at least they should have, the greatest accomplishment in China's history is a little less known. For many historians, the great fleet of Zhang He was undoubtedly China's greatest deed. Long before Magellan or Columbus, this majestic fleet sailed all the way to the eastern coast of Africa and beyond. But as successful as it was, unfortunately, its days of glory came and went, leaving behind only legends of its existence. This fleet was established in 1403, a year after Emperor Yongle of the Ming Dynasty came to power. This emperor was different from his predecessors. He wanted to create an empire that embraced inventions and exploration. He funded grand construction projects, such as the expansion of the Great Wall, and encouraged innovation. To bring about a breath of change, he moved the capital to Beijing and founded the Forbidden City. He wanted to share the gift of knowledge, so he employed scribes to gather all the knowledge they could record. The results were compiled and used to create an encyclopedia of 11,000 volumes. And if all this wasn't enough, in addition to these astonishing achievements, Yongle also commissioned the construction of a massive fleet. And this became the largest project since the building of the Great Wall of China. At the helm of his project, he appointed his eunuch, Zhang He. Zhang He was the emperor's confidant and had played a significant role in overthrowing the old ruling power in China. And now he envisioned an immense fleet, unlike anything ever seen before. To fulfill his dream, Zhang He employed no less than 20,000 of the best craftsmen who not only built the ships, but also the docks required to accommodate them. The dry docks were larger than anything previously constructed and are actually still comparable to modern ones. By the way, Europeans didn't start using dry docks until around 1495, by the time of which the Chinese had been using them for over 600 years. Anyway, the craftsmen equipped the docks with special features. When a ship was ready for launch, the basins could be filled with water, allowing the ships to float out into the Yangtze River. And that's just the docks. What they achieved in shipbuilding was nothing short of a miracle. In the end, the fleet was larger and more powerful than all the fleets of Europe during the Age of Exploration combined. It consisted of warships called Fuchuan, patrol vessels, water tankers and, largest of all, treasure ships. These colossal vessels were true engineering marvels. They measured over 120 meters in length, which is more than a football field. And to maintain maneuverability, they had a shallow draft. This white hull was divided into 16 watertight bulkheads, which is something the West hadn't perfected until the 19th century. In addition to their immense size, the treasure ships had a cargo capacity of 3,600 tons. They were anchored in port with two anchors over 2 meters long. The rudders could reach up to 11 meters in length. To harness the wind efficiency, the builders designed triangular sails that could pivot around the masts. Treasure ships could have up to 9 masts. Unlike European vessels, Junker's ships didn't lose efficiency if the wind didn't blow from the stern. One more unique characteristic of the Chinese fleet 
was its complete self-sufficiency. The tanks provided the much-needed water, while the animal transport ships had well-fed crews. And food, by the way, was crucial because a poor diet often posed problems for maritime crews. Without foods rich in vitamin C, people suffer from scurvy, a nasty disease that leaves you weak, prone to infections, and can even be fatal. But Zhang Hai found a solution to this problem. Certain transport vessels were equipped with nurseries where the crews cultivated soybeans. Soybeans are not only rich in vitamin C, but also yield a plentiful harvest in a small space. With a constant supply of plants, sailors no longer fell victim to the agonizing symptoms of scurvy. Zhang He managed to solve the centuries-old curse of sailors, which would continue to afflict European navigators until Captain Cook's expeditions three and a half centuries later. The fleet itself consisted of 300 ships and 28,000 sailors. Although the ships were large enough to accommodate settlers and colonists, the emperor had no interest in that regard. His goal was trade. In particular, the Chinese desired pepper and frankincense. In exchange for these goods, they offered silk and porcelain. At the time, the Silk Road had been closed off by the Mongols, so the Chinese were forced to become masters of navigation. Of course, it wasn't all cheers. They raised funds for expeditions by compelling smaller countries to pay them tribute. And most didn't object due to the presence of the enormous fleet. Those who did raise objections were forced into submission by the fully equipped Chinese ships armed with cannons, flamethrowers, grenade launchers, underwater mines and crossbows capable of firing 20 arrows every 15 seconds. This immense military force, coupled on the other hand with an exceptional diplomatic skill, secured Zhang He's position as the king of the seas. Through his travels, he imported medical treatments and exotic animals from the Arab world, with the most significant being the Arabian horse, which proved to be much more maneuverable than the local breed. But despite these great accomplishments and actual improvements in the Chinese society, conservative followers of Confucian teachings believed that the fleet was becoming too costly. They also believed that tradition was far more important and beneficial for the country than seeking knowledge from the outside world. These beliefs spread to the imperial court, dividing it into two factions. The traditionalists who advocated for isolation and those who desired everything the world had to offer. The problem was soon resolved on its own. In 1424, Emperor Yongle passed away. The conservatives wasted no time and took control of the throne. The new emperor, Hongshi, immediately implemented changes to ensure the centralization of China. He ordered all maritime voyages to cease and halted all shipbuilding. As strange as it sounds, from now on no new ships could be constructed or repaired within the empire. As a result, in a short time the ships began to deteriorate. By 1503, the once mighty fleet was only a tenth of its original size. The conservatives also destroyed the logbooks and any evidence of the fleet's voyages that they could find. Zhang He, however, didn't want his greatest achievements to be forgotten. He erected a monument in honor to the goddess whom he claimed had protected him during his perilous expeditions. In addition to praises and accolades, the monument included detailed descriptions of the places visited by the Chinese maritime fleet. According to these descriptions, Zhang He's vessels had reached Sumatra, Taiwan, Java, Ceylon, India, Persia and the Persian Gulf, Arabia, the Red Sea, and the eastern coast of Africa. According to some, there is also some evidence suggesting that the Chinese fleet may have even reached America, but that is of course a controversial claim. Regardless, it is incredible that the Chinese were mighty close to becoming the first global superpower. And that's just one side of the coin, because those who know a bit of history know that at one point China was seriously harassed by European powers. 
However, with a strong naval presence in China, it's hard to imagine that the Portuguese or any other Europeans would have established ports along the Chinese coast. Likewise, they might not have ventured into as many directions if the Chinese had established their presence first in India and the Persian Gulf. Centuries later, Japan might have thought twice before invading a nation that possessed such a strong maritime power. Now, these are indeed just speculations, and it is difficult to determine what would have happened if the Chinese had maintained a strong maritime presence. One thing is certain, however. A country that once looked outward and led the world through technology and a desire for exploration turned inward. And as a result, they fell into obscurity, leaving behind only faint traces of their past glory. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs, and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. I do hope to see you next time. Bye.